I've uh, practiced with two other lawyers, uh, Lorna Baldwin and myself, Eric Honey. We've been practicing together. We're all 65 years of age. We're, um, we've been practicing uh, together for th over uh, 25 years, almost 30 years. I've been practicing 36 years. We've, and uh, we uh, practice at uh, 146 Rich Richmond Road. And we've been there for 25 years, which is just across from the Canadian Bank Note Company, if you're familiar with it. In any case, uh, as I get older, more and more of my practice, it seems, uh, is related to estates, wills, and trusts, and so on and so forth. So that's become sort of an area that we've all developed. Um, and I usually give these lectures, and I take and I deliver them to various departments of the federal government and so on, and I've given them to the Ottawa Teachers Association and to Ottawa Police and so on and so forth. And most of my lectures are about three hours long. So. You guys are the guinea pigs. I'm going to give a very, very compressed version of what I usually talk about. So, and I'm not used to compressing it because I'm a man of many words. So I'm going to try and just compress it and talk about it as I would normally and just kind of skim through it. And I guess the first thing I really want to talk about is why you need a will or try to convince you that you need a will if you don't have one. And if you do have one, my words are to sort of look at your will again. One of the things I say to my clients, if you have a will, is pull that will out at least every five years and look at it and read it again and decide whether you need to change it. If you don't have a will, then this lecture is really for you because I want to put the fear of God in it and I've only got about a half an hour to do it. So, um, and I'm just on that side of why you need to re revise a will. I just had a, a, a file come in today. A gentleman came in. He, uh, he was appointed a state trustee or executor for an elderly friend of hers. She died at 90 years of age. She made her will 30 years ago. 30 years ago. And never changed the will in that period of time. He has, and, and he only learned recently he was the executor. And many of the people are dead. Uh, uh, they, some of them live in Poland, etc. It's going to be very difficult for him to, fra tra to trace these people. So again, I'm saying to you, if you have a will, pick it up in the next short while, read it again, and make sure it's up to date. Now, let's start. Why you need a will? Well, to determine why you need a will, you have to understand what happens if you don't have a will. And in Ontario, as with every province, they have their own particular legislation that deals with the states and where your money will go if you don't have a will. Uh, one of these gentlemen said, uh, was spoke to me a few moments ago, and he said, well, it goes to the government. No, it only goes to the government if they cannot find any heir at law. And the heir at law is defined in accordance with something called the Succession Law Act in Ontario. So if you don't have a will, um, it, uh, you have a spouse, and only a spouse, and she's your closest living relative, then your estate is going to go to your spouse. If you don't, if you have a spouse and children, and by children I mean over the, of any age, right, and they have to be your children or adopted children, children you may have given up in adoption are no longer your children. Uh, so, your, uh, so in other words, your blood children who have not been given up for adoption and uh, are your children in terms of, of the succession law and not stepchildren. Many times I'm speaking to people and taking will instructions, and because they're blended families, they start referring to children, and I have to get them and, and make sure that they clearly identify who, what they're talking about, because blended families are the norm these days, and so this is my child, because I've lived with this, this I've raised this young man, and in fact, I didn't adopt him, but I regard him as my child, that's not good enough from the point of view of law. So we have to define our terms, what are children. So if you have a spouse and children and you don't have a will, your spouse is entitled to the first $200,000 uh, and, and your children, and if you have one child, then it's 50-50. The balance of the estate is divided between your, your spouse and your child. If you have more than one child, then your spouse gets one third and the children get two thirds of the estate. If you, if you have no spouse, then the children share it and they share it um, uh, by representation. So if one of your children had predeceased you, having children themselves, that deceased child's children, your grandchildren, would receive their deceased child's share. Okay? So if you have no spouse and no children, 
then he goes to mother, father, or mother, father first. If no mother, father, then to sister, brother. And again, by representation. So if your sister has predeceased you, but she has children, her children will take her share. Okay? So if you have no mother, father, sister, brother, spouse, or children, or grandchildren, or great grandchildren, then it goes to the more remoter uh, uh, relatives, and you have to end of equal degree. And there's something called the table of consanguinity that says these people are of equal degree. And you look at a chart and you see, it, and those people, so it might be your <coughs> second cousin twice removed, who is of fourth degree, that person, and not only that person, will uh, share in the estate in that example. So it can get quite arbitrary. And it doesn't take into account if you've been living perhaps in a common law relationship with someone. No, they're not entitled to anything under Ontario law unless there's a special uh, act such as the uh, Canada Pension Act, which might give them benefit, or if you have to be a public servant, there happens to be the Public Servant Pension Benefits Act and so on that will provide uh, assistance to them and so on. And they be, or if you or if you uh, are joint owners of property or so on and so forth. So you can see that in that situation where you die without a will, you're dealing with a very arbitrary act which will determine who will get your estate. Now, as with everything in the law, there's an additional wrinkle. If you happen to be married, you also need to contend with something called the Family Law Act because the Family Law Act says gives you an election. Where there is no will, your surviving spouse can elect to either take under the succession law act that I've just described, or she or she can take under the family law act, which is basically a division of property which would be similar, well, it's exactly the same sort of situation as if you, the day before you died, you and your spouse decided to separate or divorce, and your spouse then made an, then decided that she wanted to divide your property as it would be permitted under the Family Law Act. So any of those of you who have been through that experience of separating and divorcing and then having to separate your property can know how difficult and how expensive and how time-consuming that will be. Now, um, but again, I want, to, I want to stress that when you're talking about division of property under the Family Law Act and the, this election, that this is only an election for a spouse to which you are legally married. So if you're living in a common law relationship, the definition of spouse under the Succession Law Reform Act, the first act I talked about, and the Family Law Act is the same. From the point of view of division of property in neither, only if you're legally married can they make this election. So for those of you who are in a common law relationship, it is, and if I leave any impression upon you, the, it is a doubly, triply, quadruply more important that you have a will in those cases. Because if you don't have a will, your common law spouse is entitled only to what you've actually left her in some other way, such as the ownership or joint ownership of property, etc. She will not benefit from either one of these acts and she'll be out in the gold. He'll be out in the gold. Okay? So that's my one of my most important points I want to make in this lecture. Now, if you are uh, so if you are married you get to make this election. I will also add that if you have a will your spouse is still entitled to make this election. Only in that case, your surviving spouse makes the election between what you provided for him or her in the will or what she, he or she is entitled to under the succession law. Okay? Under, I'm sorry, under the family law. So again, she gets, he or she, the surviving spouse, gets to make this election. And, and under either, again, under the family law act vision of property or what you provide in the will. And the reason for that is obvious, because if you left all of your property to your boyfriend or your girlfriend, depending on your situation, or your sex, or your proclivities, um, the, uh, that would uh, rule out the situation where, for example, you didn't leave enough to this individual, and so he or she could make the election to take under the Family Law Act in that situation. So is that clear? Any questions? 
By the way, I welcome questions. If you want to just stick your hand up and ask a question, I'd be welcome to, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Well, I have one question, but you may be getting it too late. Stand up, please. Uh, I have one question, but you may be getting it too late. Sure. Um, you know how older people will write a list out at home of who they want to get what? Mm -hmm. Like nothing to do with the money, but, but possessions? Does that have to be signed, dated, and witnessed? Or how do we determine if that's in fact? Well, I'll answer that question. You're way ahead of me in the lecture, but I'll answer it very, very quickly. I'll give you the answer to that question, right? Um, often when you're taking the instructions from a, from a testator and you're preparing a will, one of the things they're going to want to do is do exactly what you said. They're going to want to take their possessions, they're going to want to divvy them among, among certain relatives or certain friends and so on and so forth. And you can really make two types of lists. You can make one list that is, in, is, is, is attached to your will, is made prior to the preparation of your will, and, and is, is, uh, is, is basically part of your will, okay? And that, that list is binding on your estate. Or, if you wish, you can make a memorandum that you can prepare after the fact, and in your will, you'll usually put a clause to the effect that uh, 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 you, this is a morally binding clause and you are uh, requesting that your beneficiaries and your executor honor your intentions as set out in this memorandum, recognizing that there's a possibility that they may object to it and, and not permit it to, to proceed. And the, the beauty of that second type of list is it doesn't have to be made before you do your will, but it can be made at a later date. And you can change it so anybody gets on your shit list, you can just cross them off. You don't have to leave anything to them, you know. Oh, it's, she wasn't very nice to me today, so she's not getting the, you know, the, the, the Persian carpet in the living room, you know. Okay. So, uh, in any case, so that's testate and intestate succession. I also want to talk to you a couple of minutes about marriage contracts and how marriage contracts can be part of your estate plan. Okay? So marriage contracts, let's take an example. When I started to practice law, marriage contracts had just come in. I started practicing in 1977. The act had just come in, the family law called the Family Law Reform Act as it was then, came in in 1978. And under that act, they permitted marriage contracts. And we weren't allowed to do that in Ontario. In Quebec, they've been part of their practice forever, but they weren't permitted in Ontario because they thought that they would promote divorce and separation and they were contrary to public policy. But times had changed, people were, you know, divorce was getting, we amended the Divorce Act and things were changing. So I thought as a young lawyer that marriage contracts were going to be the thing, right? Everybody was going to run in and try, want to do a marriage contract. We're getting married, we're going to decide now how our property is going to be separated or divided in the event that we separate. And we'll You'll, we'll decide who's going to walk the dog and who's going to wash the dishes and we're going to do all of these things. None of that happened. There was a resounding silence. I didn't get anybody coming, hardly anybody, coming into my office and saying, you know, we'd like to do a marriage contract. <coughs> I tried one on one of my first wives. She didn't like it. So, I didn't like it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so that didn't happen. But lo and behold, and I mean, here we're talking about preparing wills. Many of us are now in second, sometimes third relationships in which, and what we're concerned about is we work long and hard for <coughs> the money that, that we have. So part and parcel of what we may want to do is we may want to look after and preserve our property, but at the same time look after the person that we're now uh, newly married to. So take Bill and Judy, and Bill and Judy decide to get married, and the first question they ask is, well, where, where are we going to live? Bill says, look, Mary, why don't we live in my house? I live in the Rideau River, it's, you have a big garden, and you know how you love the garden. You sell your condominium, put the money in the bank, you can use the interest on it, and, you know, we'll go to Vegas or something. And so, in any case, that's what they do. So Bill and Mary decide to get married, they're going to move into Bill's house. But the first thing they're going to worry about is, what is, how can I hurt something under the Family Law Act that, that, that if I move into the family home, that, that, that home that belongs to you, uh, 
uh, I may have a claim on it, or you may have a claim on it when we, if we separate or divorce or something like that, or if you die. And so they want to preserve their property. They want to make sure that what they own and what they have, they preserve, but at the same time, they look after their loved ones. So this can be where a marriage contract can come into play. It can, it can make it, it can be an agreement that notwithstanding the fact that you're married, there'll be no pooling of your resources. What's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. And that can dovetail nicely with, with a will in as, in as much as, it, as the will may say, well, in the event of my death, all of my property goes to my children, and Mary has a similar will that all of her property goes to her children, but makes a special allowance, for example, about certain properties that Mary can continue to enjoy in case Bill happens to pass away, such as the matrimonial home. Okay? So, Bill says, I leave all of my assets to my children, but Mary, in the event of my death, can stay in the matrimonial home as long as she likes, as long as she maintains the house, keeps the property, pays the taxes, uh, and, um, you know, just looks after the property. And then, when Mary is no longer wants to live in the house, the house can be sold, uh, disposed of, and the, ask, the proceeds will go to my children, and Mary will no longer have a need for that house. So, the will says, I leave everything to my property, subject to this life interest of Mary, and they have an agreement that says the same thing. Now, why do they have an agreement? Because a will can be changed, right? John could say, or, or Bill could say, sure, Mary, I'm gonna set a will that you're gonna be able to continue to live in the house, and then he changes his will the next week, and Mary, Bill dies, and lo and behold, Mary finds out that Bill has not kept his promise, has changed his will, and hasn't made a life interest in marriage for the house. So that's where a marriage contract might be part of your estate plan. Okay? All right. Um, I want to talk about types of wills. I want to talk about uh, things like holograph wills and wills that you might choose to make yourself. Okay? Does anybody know what a holograph will is? Yeah, exactly. It's a handwritten will, that you, and the only requirements for a handwritten will are that you handwrite it yourself and you sign it, okay? Holograph wills used to be called soldier's wills, and again, they weren't legal in Ontario except in the case of soldiers or military people until 1977. Prior to that, um, the only, as I said, the only, the only people that would be permitted to do that in Ontario residents would be holograph wills. My dad was in the First World War. In the back of his pay book that I have from the First Great War is, was instructions on how to do a holograph will. And in it he said, I leave, I appoint my mother Mary, I mean really was Mary, to be my executor and I leave all of my property to my, to, to my mother. Right? He was 17 years age when he enlisted and he was 18 years when he went overseas. So that was a holograph will, and it gave instructions. And to be a holograph will, it had to be in your own handwriting and signed. And that was the only thing that it required to do, okay? Holograph wills are really wills that you might do in an emergency situation. The, the, the example that was taught us in law school was of the farmer who was out in the field in Saskatchewan, because in Saskatchewan, these wills were permitted, and he was um, um, driving his tractor, and his tractor flipped over and pinned him uh, to the ground, and uh, and in the in the mud and the paint of the of the fender, he scratched. I leave my entire estate to my wife Mary and appoint her to be my executor. Signed it, and that was a will. And they took the fender off the tractor, took it to probate court in Saskatoon, probated it, and in fact, that was a valid will, a valid holograph will. So that's the type of situation you might you might use for a will. You may use a will like that. I have sometimes recommended to a client to do a will. You get a, a client, they phone you up, they're on their way to uh, a trip, and they say, gee, Frank, I'm leaving uh, uh, for Cancun uh, tomorrow at 7. Can I slip in and do a will? No. It's 4 o'clock on Thursday. You're leaving on Friday morning. I don't think I can, can do it that quickly. But if I know the person well enough, I might, in very limited circumstances, dictate a polygraph will over the phone to him, and I say, here's what to say. I appoint my wife, Mary, <laughs> oh, being next Mary, to be my executor. I leave everything to my, to my wife, Mary, and appoint her executor, and, 
and uh, if she should predecease me, I leave everything to my children uh, uh, and then sign it, and that's it, and that'll be a holograph will. And I say, now you promise when you get home, you're going to come and see me, you're going to do a proper will, because that's the bare, 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 bare bones. You've appointed an executor, you've said who's going to receive the estate, and who's going to, and in case your spouse predeceases, you're going to make arrangements for your children. Might be something more elaborate than that, depending on the situation. But that's what a holograph will is, and that's the limited purposes to which you might put a, uh, you might um, use that. You can also do a holograph where holograph wills are permitted. They're permitted in Ontario. You can do a holograph amendment to an existing will. So, for example, if you wanted to change the cl clause in your will, you could do that by a holograph. You could. Now, the problem is what I see is people taking a copy of their will and writing on that will the changes and expecting that that is going to be a valid, validly change their will. And I'm going to tell you that won't do the job. You may do more damage than good. So if you're inclined to want to make a change to your will, don't, do, don't use this process. Go and see your lawyer and have it properly changed. Okay? All right. So that's a holograph will. The other type of will that I commonly see from time to time, other than a, a, a lawyer, a, a will properly prepared by a lawyer, are wills uh, that are taken off the internet. Okay? In the old days when I started to practice law, the type of will that I saw most often <coughs> was, uh, was a fill-in-the-blanks will. And these were wills that, you know, you'd go to a stationery store and you'd see those, those uh, uh, shelving, rotating shelving. You'd have do your own lease, do your own will, do your own agreement of purchase and sale. You'd take it off. There'd be a set of instructions. You'd fill in the blanks and th there would be your will, right? Your powers of attorney and so on and so forth. Uh, the problem with those uh, uh, documents were most often that mistakes critical mistakes were made in the preparation of those wills because people would misunderstand language or put in words that they thought had a certain meaning and they would have a much different meaning. For example, most, uh, the, one, the example that comes to mind is of a, 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 a farmer uh, who um, uh, left a will, he uh, filled in a blanks will, and he said, I leave everything to my wife Mary and then to the children. And the problem with that will was it created what was called a life estate. It didn't leave, because he attached a condition to the gift and the will, I leave everything to my wife Mary, the condition being then, then to the children, she only had a life estate in the property. Okay? That was not enough. Now, she could have made an election under the Family Law Act and said, I reject the will. I want to take what I'm entitled to under the Family Law Act. But that wouldn't have been enough. That wouldn't have achieved what the goals that she needed to. She needed the entire estate to look after herself. So what we had to do was we had to go to the children and get the children to renounce. Six children, five renounced. Well, you know, four children, five, my wife. And, and so, of course, we had to deal with that one child, and that one child eventually agreed to renounce his share after his mother paid him $5,000. Now we know what happened to that kid, don't we? Got cut out of the mother's will. <laughs> but in any case, you can see the problem. Right? So if you try to do your own will. Now, the other thing about these fill-in-the-blank wills, and one of the things is, is, uh, <coughs> is the, the uh, other problems that can be done is the fact that you don't know certain legal principles that might be of assistance to you. And let me give you an example. I had a, a couple came in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, two sisters came in, their mother had died, she had done her own will, a fill in the blanks will on the, on the computer, and, uh, and she gave it to me and I had a look at it and, I, and we talked to them a few moments, and I learned that they had a brother, and the brother, would, so the estate said, I appoint my daughter Mary and Joan to be my executors, and I leave my estate to my children uh, to be equally divided among my, my children, Mary, Joan, and my son Bill. The problem was that Bill was, uh, uh, was, a dis was had a disability, a mental disability, and he was um, 
uh, on ODSP, Ontario uh, Disability Support Program, and was receiving payments. And uh, as soon as they heard that he was receiving these payments, they cut him off immediately because there's a means test associated with ODSP. Had the mother gone in and seen uh, a lawyer, the lawyer would have told her that she could have done what's called a Hanson Trust. And a Hanson Trust is a very simple device in which the, uh, a share of the estate is held in trust for the benefit of child, but it never actually becomes the child's. So, and it's the payments that are made are entirely discretionary. The end result is it doesn't deprive the child of the benefit of whatever payments they may be receiving from out some outside source, such as ODSP. And the executor can then just top up the amount that the child it receives annually or each year in order that that child gets the maximum benefit from, from the, whatever support program they get and still gets the maximum benefit from the will permitted without affecting, adversely affecting the amount that they get under the Hanson Trust. So this is a device. So the other benefit, uh, or, the, or the drawback, I'm sorry, uh, drawback I suppose, of trying to do your own will is your lack of no, the knowledge that a, a competent lawyer would have that might have no a device in which might save the money or, put, or assist with the proper preparation or the proper uh, construction of your will to ensure that your children or your beneficiaries get the maximum benefit. Okay, your, your lawyer should also know certain basics about taxes and be able to make suggestions on how to structure your will so to avoid uh, certain tax pitfalls, etc. And maybe give you some constructive ideas of how of some estate planning on how to structure your will and so on and so forth. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about the construction. Let me see. It's uh, 8 o'clock. How much longer do you want me to go with this? 15 minutes? Is that good? Sure. I can talk forever. <coughs> Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the construction of a standard will. Okay? And then I'll talk a little bit about probate, what it is, and talk about... Uh, um, and talk about um, powers of attorney for, for property and personal care, which is, and living wills, which are other things that you should do in the, at the time that you are preparing your will and as part of the instructions to your lawyer. So let's just talk a little bit about a will. Um, the first thing, the first question that I want to know when I am taking will instructions is obviously who you are and what you are, and I want to know a little bit about your income, a little bit about your your children and your background and so on and so forth and who you consider to be your beneficiaries and what basically you you feel you want to achieve by this one. So I have to get to know you a little bit. Okay, so usually my, uh, my first initial meeting with you will be about an hour and we'll talk about what you're trying to achieve and so on, okay? And so uh, the first question, the first big issue we're going to tackle is who do you want to be your executive? Generally speaking, if you're in a married relationship or cohabiting with someone, it'll often be your, your partner, your spouse, will be your executor, right? And probably she or she will be the main beneficiary of your estate. So there's an obvious uh, uh, benefit and um, uh, uh, normalcy to, uh, to choosing your closest partner as being the executor of your estate. The other thing you're going to want to do is what happens if that person predeceases you? You're, then you're, who's going to be your second choice? Well, it's often going to be your children or you're going to select from among your children, right? There's no hard and fast rule. You want someone who is competent, who is uh, honest, and has integrity, common sense. Uh, uh, there are also more practi other practical issues about, preferably you want the person that has a good intimate knowledge of your affairs, so you have to keep them in the know. You want someone who is prepared to do it because they don't have to. You can't force it on. If a person doesn't want to be your executor, they don't have to be your executor, even after you've appointed them, even after they've agreed to it. If, in fact, you pass away and they change their mind, they can change their mind. They're always free to withdraw. Um, you uh, should, if possible, choose someone that lives close by, that is, can physically attend to the duties 
be in the city or the area. But that's not always possible, of course. Uh, so you may have to choose, if, you, if they're outside of the jurisdiction, and the jurisdiction is the province of Ontario, by the way, or the, the province in which you live, then uh, they may have to post a bond. A, a bond is, is a performance bond, if you will. Uh, the court may request it unless the other, exec other beneficiaries uh, don't require it or consent that there be no bond or there be other uh, compelling reasons not to have a bond. Okay? Bonds aren't expensive, but they're like an insurance that you perform. And the court's approach to it is this. If you're outside of the jurisdiction, outside of the province of Ontario, outside of the jurisdiction of the courts of Ontario, they have no way of enforcing your obligations to, to comply with the terms of the will, to uh, distribute the assets to the beneficiaries and to, and to carry out, to pay the debts and to carry out the other instructions because you're outside of the court's control. Okay? So that's why you, you try to choose somebody that is within the province of Ontario. But if you don't have that person, don't make that, you know, that can't be the all-consuming reason. For example, I had a person in my office today, we were talking about this, and they wanted to set up a special arrangement for a daughter who had a, um, an unfortunate marriage, and she, they were uh, concerned about the fact that uh, she was unduly influenced or was um, a matrimonial problem. And so their other two, they had one, their daughter lived in Ottawa, the other two children lived outside of Ontario. And we decided, after some discussion, uh, that notwithstanding that their first choice usually normally would have been their daughter because of all of the others, she's close, she had a good understanding of their situation, her account, her background was accounting and so on and so forth, they decided against this and they decided to choose the other children because of this family situation she happened to find herself in. So, you know, there's a whole lot of things that have to go into how you choose an executor. And, uh, yes? A man with a question. Yes. What about having multiple? Yes. Well, you can have multiple. You, it, that's an interesting question because you can have multiple executives. So, so you could have, you know, your, your all of your children could be the executors for that matter if you wanted them. If you had four or five or six. John Diefenbaker had seven executors, and he and in his situation, however. They had specific duties. So he had a literary executor. He had another executor that looked after the Diefenbaker uh, um, uh, estate in Saskatchewan or wherever it is, and so on and so forth. So he had executors for different purposes, right? You can even have multiple wills in some cases. You could have, for example, one will that deals with with uh, property in Ontario another will that might deal with just your corporate assets, and you might have a will that deals with property in another jurisdiction. Okay? So, so again, I have to know what your assets are, because, for example, I've had situations where we've had people that have had assets in multiple countries, and I've had to say, look, I don't know anything about the law in Pakistan, or I don't know anything law about the law in France or, or Ireland. And, you know, for that property, you, there's a separate, different set of criteria, and I'm going to suggest to you that you see an Irish attorney to deal with that. I have a long, interesting sort of uh, anecdote about that, but I don't have time to talk about it. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm a little hard of hearing. Um, That's, yeah. Well, you pointed out an important problem, and that's right. If you appoint two executors, those executors are going to have to be able to do things together. But it, they don't necessarily have to show up at the bank at the same time, but they may have to show up at the bank at some time, right? The other thing is, of course, in this modern age, what I generally do is I scan the document, send it out to them wherever they happen to be. They sign the document in front of a, a guarantor or in front of a notary or in front of a lawyer or with a proper yeah, witnesses, send it back and send it to the bank. When you went to go pay a bill at a bank, you know, if I wanted to deposit something or I wanted to pay a bill... 
Well, they normally, here's a, here's a little tip. Banks will always take your money. Okay? <laughs> they don't need both of you to show up. They do. No, they don't. They, they sometimes think they do. But, I mean, I know this because in my practice, No, but if you if you apply for probate and you've got two people, yes. they're going to be both and they're going to have, they're going to be joint. They're going to have to do it all together. Yes. But in terms of let's just deal with that isolated example. Okay, putting money into the bank. Okay, I, I mean, as long as you properly designate the account and you have and and they will deposit it. They will accept the deposit. The difficulty in terms of paying a bill is you usually have to set up an arrangement with the bank to pay bills. For example, we're going to talk about probate for a minute, but probate is the validation of the will. So prior to probate, the bank might say, we'll only deal with this estate in a limited way. We will pay certain debts, certain bills that come up if there's enough money in the account to cover those debts, right? Such as burial expenses, some ongoing expenses related to the house, for example, condominium fees or a mortgage payment or something of that nature. They'll, they will make those payments even before there is probate. Right? What they won't do before probate is go and pay out, distribute the estate or pay the money over to the executor. So this is what can be achieved with a bank. But usually banks have to be approached um, Delicate, not delicately, but you have to impress them that you know more about what's going on than they do. Because very often you're dealing with a junior teller or something, you have to set and say, look, this is what you're going to do, this is, you're empowered to do this, this is why we need it done, and if you don't do it, you're going to be in shame. That's my approach to it. Does that help? No? Well, you know what? I'm going to stay after. Why don't you and I have a talk and we'll see whether we can work at that moment. Okay. All right. So, that's talking about uh, the appointment of an executor and the duties of an executor. Okay. And so, what an executor does is they take over the estate, they take over the management estate. The beauty, if you don't have a will, or you, or you don't have an executor, let's say your executor passes away, or your executor refuses to take up the obligations of being their executive, then uh, the problem is you don't have anybody to take over the administration of your estate and look after your estate right from day one. If you have a will, even if you don't have probate, you've got someone that's going to take over those duties and those obligations. And the reason you want that is to protect your assets and to have somebody, make, you know, uh, collecting and protecting your assets, determining what your assets are doing, and doing things as they become necessary. For example, if you pass away and you've got a cottage up in the Gatineau, and winter's coming, who has the right and who's going to go up and make sure the water's taken out, the boats are taken out, and these kind of things? Who's going to make sure that your bills are paid? Who's going to go to the bank and make sure your mortgage is paid? all of this kind of thing. Unless you have an executor, or going to make sure that your insurance is kept up on the house, or make sure that somebody goes by and through the house and make sure the pipes don't freeze. That's going to be your executor. Now, hopefully you've got a family member, but if you don't have a family member that's going to take up the duty, etc. You need somebody that legally has the right. And as an executor, they have that right, right from day one. The, we, the will speaks as, the, of, as of the date of death. Okay, so that's going to deal with as much I'm going to say about his executors from now on. The next thing we're going to talk about is the beneficiaries. Who are your dependents? Who must you? So when I'm talking to my clients, I have to determine who do you wish to benefit and who must you benefit? You must benefit dependents. Okay? What is a dependent? Well, a dependent is, it could be your grandmother, your grandfather, your son that's still living in the basement and playing pong every day who's 26 years of age and should have had a job years ago, they can be your dependent, believe it or not, okay? Ex-spouses can be your dependent. So those are all questions that I'm going to ask you in the preparation and drafting of your will to make sure that we cover off those obligations that you need to cover off 
and that they're adequately taken care of, in addition to those people that you want to benefit. We're going to take instructions. You want to benefit a charity, for example, we're going to make sure we do have the charity properly defined. Now, I'm running out of time, and I'm running over my lecture time. So I'm just going to talk about two other things quickly. Powers of attorney for property and personal care. I really haven't covered this, these, uh, these topics adequately. I've been running, I just haven't budgeted my time. In addition to doing a will, you should also do a power of attorney for property and a power of attorney for personal care. A power of attorney for property is a document that says it only speaks while you're still alive. And what you want a power of attorney to do is to, t is to make it possible for your loved ones to administer your affairs in the event that you can't. So a continuing power of a pro attorney means a power of attorney that entitles the named individual, the attorney, not a lawyer, but an attorney, the person you've turned this power over to, to manage your affairs, okay? And they can do it even if you are incompetent, and that's what you need it for. Okay? So that's something everybody should have in addition to the will. Because if you don't have a power of attorney, then your, your loved ones will have to apply to the province of Ontario to be appointed the guardian of your property. And if they have to do that, they have to go through a very difficult and arduous process in order to be appointed. And they have to report on a regular basis the finances and so on to the province of Ontario and to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the Attorney General's office and through the courts. Yes? Does that have to be done by a lawyer, power of attorney? No. You could do your own power of attorney. When, the, when 1995, when the Substitute Decisions Act, they brought out an act and they started promoting people doing their own powers of attorney. You may remember that. You may remember that they were saying everybody should have a power of attorney for property and personal care. And a lot of people were filling in these, they were loading them down off the internet, they were filling them up. What happened was a lot of fraudulent powers of attorney were prepared, right? Elderly people in homes were convinced of the necessity of having powers of attorney. They gave them to, you know, uh, people that shouldn't have had them, and then they, they basically stole from them using the power of attorney. So now, uh, those powers of attorney are powers of attorney are being very scrutinized now these days. So generally speaking, it's it's a better advice to have a lawyer prepare it, although it's not necessary. Okay, not uh, for the reason of, the, a power of attorney for personal care is a is a power of attorney that's a pre, that is valid only in the event that you're incompetent, and it's the person who makes health care decisions. So. Continuing power of attorney for property deals with property. That's real property and personal property. What you own and what you or what you own, whatever it might be. Your personal care power of attorney is says who makes a health care decision, which could be a health care decision, which may be as important as uh, a life and death decision, or it may be whether you wear pink or blue booties in the home. You know, it can be as trivial as that, or it can be as important as a life and death decision. So what you're doing is you're appointing something to make these healthcare decisions for you. Hand in hand with a personal care power of attorney is a living will. Does anybody know what a living will is? A living will is a document that says, in the event that you have a terminal illness or traumatic injury, you do not want um, uh, 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 heroic methods to be used to keep you alive. Okay? So, if a person's in the hospital, the person who has the personal care power of attorney may, may make those decisions. The living will gives them instructions as what decision you want to make in a certain circumstance. It is not mandatory. It is not compelling at law. It is simply a letter of instruction, if you will, that if this situation exists, that I am terminally ill, and there is no chance I'm going to recover, I don't want to be resuscitated. I don't want to have heroic methods used to keep me alive. I don't want you to perform an operation or procedure that is going, not going to improve my life and not going to, to uh, incre improve my, my, expecta my life expectations. Okay? So that's a living room. And with that, I'm going to stop because I've run over my time. Thank you. Oh, now I'm going to ask for answers.